In the early months of 2014, I was playing around on YouTube, watching and listening to some of Jimmy Martin's recordings that he had made not too long before he died. As I watched the first half of the film, Jimmy was cussing like a sailor. Every other word started with the letter F. This was not the man I knew. I ordered a copy of the film. When it arrived, I watched it over and over because I still couldn't believe what I was seeing and hearing. I was saddened by the cussing and hearing him say, I'm not good enough for the Grand Ole Opry. It was obviously a defensive move by Jimmy to deny the mental pain he had suffered daily for over 50 years because he was never asked to join the Opry. In turn, we all suffered. As the last person living who knows the true story of why Jimmy was never made a member of the Opry, I decided it was time to write this book. This book is not only about why Jimmy was not a member of the Opry, but it's also the story of our family. Who could have been at the top of the world? We could have had the best family band ever. Our children were all musicians and good singers. I was a good booking agent and manager. But I had a client who wouldn't listen, and I didn't know enough to help him. This would lead to a world of heartaches for our family. So much has been written about Jimmy Martin. Some true, some not. In fact, I read an article one time claiming he was a Melungeon. A Melungeon is a term traditionally used for a person of many mixed European, African, and Native American racial groups. They are located in the Cumberland Gap area of central Appalachia. This includes portions of East Tennessee, Southwest Virginia, and Eastern Kentucky. He was not. It was rumored that his brother-in-law was a Melungeon, but that was never proven. I hope you will understand Jimmy Martin better after reading this book. Jimmy was a kind-hearted man and a father who cared deeply for his children, but was unable to let them know it. He was a terrific entertainer and singer, a man who suffered humiliation and coped with it in ways that only further injured his pride and his standing in the music world. He was often misunderstood. He hid behind the don't-care facade he built around himself. Now you will know the reason for his behavior as well as my part in it, both good and bad. Chapter 1, Meeting Jimmy Martin in early May 1953, my girlfriend, Jean Armstrong, suggested I apply in the coffee shop where she worked as a waitress at the Tulane Hotel in Nashville. The hotel was situated on the corner of 8th Avenue North and Church Street. It was the equivalent of a two- or three-star rated hotel in today's market. The restaurant served breakfast, lunch, and supper, nothing fancy. The Tulane was cheap, clean, nice, and convenient, a magnet for sidemen from the Grand Ole Opry. Musicians who lived there and worked at the Opry didn't need a car. They could take their instruments, unless it was an upright bass, and walk to the Ryman Auditorium where the Opry was held. The Ryman was located on Fifth Avenue between Broadway and Commerce Street, about six or seven blocks. I applied in the coffee shop at the hotel and was hired the same day. I started to work the next week. On my first day of work, I met Bessie Lee Malden, Bill Monroe's longtime girlfriend. Bessie was a well-endowed, beautiful blonde and an immaculate dresser. I was envious of her beauty and fashion. She was easy to talk to. Maybe she needed a friend, who knows? but she befriended me. It wasn't long before she told me she was Bill Monroe's girlfriend and had been for many years. Bessie said Bill was still married to his wife, Carolyn, and they had two children. But that didn't stop Bill and Bessie. He took her everywhere. She even appeared with Bill and his daughter, Melissa, on stage. Despite the fact I was a transplanted Nashville girl, I had no idea who Bill Monroe was at the time, nor did I care. I did know he played on the Opry, 
because Bessie told me. Bessie was not only Bill's longtime girlfriend, but also his bass player. Within a week of starting work, I met Rudy Lyle, Ellie White, Sonny Osborne, Charlie Klein, and into my life came Jimmy Martin. They were all side men for Bill. They didn't impress me, but I thought they were nice guys. I still didn't know anything about Bill Monroe. The last time I had gone to the Grand Ole Opry, I was three or four years old, and it was held in the old Dixie Tabernacle. I don't remember going, but Mother told me we went. When Jimmy first came into the restaurant and sat at one of my tables, he immediately asked me out. At the time, he was 25 years old, and I was only 17, with a smart mouth. I told him, no, if I wanted to go out with my daddy, I would go home and get him. Even though I thought of Jimmy as old, he was still very good looking and a charmer. He had beautiful blue eyes. His hair was a dirty brown color and sort of thin, but not as thin as it was in later years. I liked him and I didn't. I wanted to go out with him and I didn't. I thought it would be exciting to go to the Opry with him, but I didn't want to get involved with him. Those mixed feelings would keep me with him for the next 14 years. Jimmy came to the restaurant every day. He was not a big tipper, but he was a big talker. He often left a penny under each plate, cup, saucer, or whatever dish he was using. That irritated me to no end. He thought he was playing a joke, but what he was doing was ripping off the waitress. In my mind, he was a typical old man trying to be cute. I didn't think it was funny, yet he had that charisma tugging at my heart. I had to keep telling myself, don't get sucked in, he's too old. A few weeks after I started work at the Tulane Hotel, Jean and I decided to go skating one Friday night. We took our skates and extra clothes to work. Jean and I had been going to the Hippodrome skating rink since we were in the ninth grade and considered ourselves regular. Our weekends were consumed with skating. Looking back now, we were kids doing kids' things while living in a grown-up world. After work, we caught the bus and went to the Hippodrome. When we got there, we put our skates on and went out onto the floor. We made a few rounds, but none of our skating partners was there. So we took off our skates, caught the bus, and went back to town. We were standing on Union Street waiting for our bus to go home when it started pouring down rain. No umbrellas. We were soaking wet. We did have a piece of plastic covering our heads. It was Friday night, and we weren't really ready to go home. From where we were standing, we could see the National Life and Accident Insurance Company building where radio station WSM had its studios. And we wondered if Ellie White and Jimmy were at WSM. Jean said, why don't I call Ellie and maybe we can go up to the WSM studios. That sounded good. I liked Ellie, but was not crazy about Jimmy Martin. I was hoping I might meet someone else at WSM I could hang out with. Jean went inside the restaurant and called L.E., and he invited us up to the studio. Neither Jean nor I had ever been in a radio studio. Our lives were to change forever with this one visit to WSM. When we got to the studio, L.E. met us at the elevator and took us up to the studio. Of course, Jimmy was there, and he was thrilled that I was along. He immediately came over and took my hand and started showing me around. He introduced me to Eddie Hill and Randy Hughes. Randy and I hit it off right away. I had never heard of Eddie Hill, but later found out he was very important in the country music field. In fact, at that time of my life, I was not a country music fan, 
and certainly not a bluegrass music fan. I didn't even know or care about what bluegrass or country music was or who was involved in those music fields. I had met one country music artist in my lifetime, and that was Carl Smith. I met Carl at a concert in Centennial Park. He later called and asked me out, but I had just washed my hair and politely refused. That was before personal hair dryers. Carl and I never dated, but we remained friends. Once in a while through the years, he would call me just to talk. And whenever I did see him, we always had great conversations and mutual respect for each other. After Jimmy and Ellie finished the radio show, Jimmy said the two of them would take Gene and me home. Then I saw Jimmy's car. I wanted to turn around and go catch the bus. It was a Hudson, bright blue and yellow, a monstrosity. Jimmy asked Ellie to drive, and Jimmy and I got into the back seat. He immediately wanted to paw me. I wasn't into that and asked him to keep his hands to himself. We went to Olive's drive-in restaurant on Charlotte Avenue, where we sat in the car laughing and talking for a couple of hours. We had a lot of fun. It was a nice evening, and I began liking him a little more. While sitting in the car at Olive's, two boys Gene and I knew from school, Monk DeMumberin and Jimmy White, showed up. Gene liked Monk, and I was crazy about Jimmy White from afar. Unfortunately, I don't think either of them felt the same way about us. Gene and I were definitely not part of the in crowd in high school, and neither of us participated in any activities. Regardless, I wanted to talk to Jimmy and Monk. One of them had my class ring, and I wanted it back. I had let them look at it, and they kept it. I never saw the ring again. After Gene and I finished our conversation with Monk and Jimmy White, Ellie and Jimmy Martin drove us to my house. Jimmy kissed me goodnight and said he would see me the next day. I enjoyed the kiss, but I told myself, don't do it again. Jimmy was 25 years old. I knew he was too old for me. I also knew he drank a lot, and I didn't like that. My mother was an alcoholic, and I couldn't tolerate a drunk. However, Jimmy was a persuasive man, very handsome, and very talented. When he gave me that movie star smile, I melted. It was a smile that would make you want to jump his bones. Jimmy and I continued to talk every day. After a couple of weeks, he started asking me to go places with him. Once again, I kept telling myself, don't get sucked in. I didn't listen. And in the end, I started going places with him. Since the Tulane Hotel was in the downtown area of Nashville, Jimmy and I started walking around after I got off from work. We would look in the store windows, go in the stores if we saw something we liked, hold hands, and talk. Jimmy was extremely nice to me. During one of those walks, he brought me a beautiful pair of earrings from Harvey's, an upscale store in Nashville. Back then, we didn't use the word upscale. This was the very first thing I ever had from Harvey's. Regardless, Jimmy was baiting me and I didn't know it. He was nice to me and now I was liking him more and more despite his drinking. I kept telling myself his drinking wasn't that bad. Soon, Gene and I were joining Ellie and Jimmy in their Tulane hotel rooms and partying with all the bluegrass boys, except for Sonny Osborne, who was only 15 at the time. Partying then was not like it is today. Sitting around in one of the musicians' rooms, usually Jimmy's, drinking beer, talking, and singing was partying. I don't think anyone in the group drank hard liquor. Sonny was only a kid, and I remember him just sitting in the window listening to everything. 
I don't remember any of the Bluegrass boys living in the hotel, having a girlfriend, or bringing a girl to the rooms. Jean and I were the only females. Jean was dating L.E., and I was with Jimmy. After the party broke up, Jean and L.E. would go to L.E.'s room. Then Jimmy and I would lock the door and hit the sheets. The Bluegrass Boys were a group of very nice country guys. I never saw or heard any of them talking about women in a negative way or using foul language. I never saw or knew any of them using any kind of drug. I think their drug of choice was music. That seemed to be all any of them ever thought about when they were together. This was a group of men who had grown up in the 30s and 40s, most of them in the country. They were taught to respect people and things. To Jean and me, they were always very respectful. Jimmy and I were a couple, and they respected that. They also respected Ellie and Jean. Personally, I thought of most of them as being uneducated and lonely. Sonny was still in school, and when school commenced, he returned home. I knew the guys working for Bill were not making much money. Jimmy told me they were paid $10 for each segment they played on the Opry and that they were paid for the show at the studios. They rarely went out of town on a show, so one could figure their weekly pay was about $25. They were barely skimming by. Jimmy was smarter than most with his money. He was a saver. He always had cash. If someone needed to borrow money, Jimmy would let them have it. I always told him he could squeeze a dime until it turned into a dollar. Jimmy was this handsome devil of a man. I thought he was the most handsome side man on the Opry. He had the most beautiful blue eyes and smile and was about the same height as me or maybe an inch taller. I was five foot seven and a half inches tall with dark brown hair, green eyes, and I never weighed over 120 pounds. Despite his drinking, I thought Jimmy was a very caring person. I soon found out that he cried easily, and that made him even more special to me. He was someone with a heart. The good times were in high gear, and I started staying away from home more and more. My mother called the Tulane and told them I was underage and to keep me out of the hotel. Her phone call did nothing but cause me to lose my job. Jimmy devised a plan where he would meet me at the back door and we would take the back stairs to his room. Several months passed before I went back through the lobby. By now, Jimmy was like an addiction to me. He and I could look at each other and we would find a place to have sex. If we were in the hotel, we would head for Jimmy's room. If we were in the car, we would find a place to pull over and make love in the car. We didn't care where we were. Wanted it, needed it, let's get on with it. That was sort of our motto. Jimmy was an experienced lover, and in the beginning he took his time, and our lovemaking was exciting and satisfying for both of us. It would be many years before that would change. In those days, Jimmy was a lot of fun. He liked to kid around. Charlie Klein played fiddle for Bill Monroe and was also living at the Tulane. I liked Charlie and I thought he was a nice guy. He was funny and I thought a little off the wall. One day, Jimmy and I were in Charlie's room playing around. Jimmy liked to tickle me because he knew I would jump. That day he grabbed me and started tickling. When he let go, I fell backwards onto the bed, smashing Bill's prize fiddle that was on the bed. Charlie, Jimmy, and I were stunned. What do we do now? Charlie was afraid to tell Bill. Jimmy was yelling about the fiddle being smashed beyond repair. I didn't know what to do, but somehow or other, the fiddle got repaired, though I don't remember how, and Charlie stayed out of trouble. Needless to say, we never did that again. Our life together, such as it was, was not all about sex. 
we had a lot of serious moments when we would talk about what we wanted in the future. He loved family. He wanted to be a star and to be on the Grand Ole Opry. I didn't know anything about music, but I was willing to help him. We talked about education. Jimmy was embarrassed that he didn't have even a grammar school education or the opportunity to get one. When I first met him, he could barely write his name. We practiced for hours. He wanted to learn to write his name in a flamboyant way, not actually what he said, because flamboyant was not a word he used, because the capital M in his last name was difficult for him to write. He started making it square at the top. He liked that. He thought it looked good, but at times he would revert back to the way the M is supposed to be written. I think in his mind, he was trying to determine what looked best when he signed autographs. We talked about many things, including his family and my family. Those were the best times, just sitting on the bed and talking. Times and things were changing, and we all knew that. Jean was no longer going with Ellie and was now dating Don Sud Slayman, who played fiddle for Marty Robbins. Don and Jean were madly in love with each other and would later marry. They were together until Don's death in 2006. Jean passed away in 2013. One night, after I'd had words with Jimmy about his drinking, Jean asked me if I would like to go with her, Don Slayman, and Marty Robbins to the Starlight. The Starlight was a club on Dickerson Road where everyone went to dance. Of course I said yes. Who wouldn't want to be in the company of Marty Robbins? I went, and we were having a wonderful time. Marty and I had just finished a dance and walked back to our table. As we sat down, who shows up at our table but Jimmy Martin? Jimmy said, let's go. I said, no. Marty said, leave her alone. She's with me. Jimmy was getting madder by the minute. I knew Marty was a former fighter, and I didn't want to see Jimmy hurt. I asked Marty to let it go and said I would go with Jimmy. Little did I know that it would be 20 years before Marty spoke to me again. Whenever he saw Jimmy and me at shows throughout those years, he turned his head and walked away. Then, in 1972, I was walking up Fifth Avenue from Broad Street on my way back to work. Marty was standing in front of the Ryman Auditorium, just standing there. As I started by, he said, Don't you speak to old friends? I was taken aback. We hugged each other, sat down on the front steps of the Ryman, and just talked. I kissed him goodbye, not knowing it would be the last time I would see him alive. That night, as I left the starlight with Jimmy, I was livid. Johnny Seibert was driving the car. Johnny was a steel guitar player on the Opry with Carl Smith. When we got to 8th Avenue and Church Street, the corner where the two-lane was located, Jimmy wanted to get out of the car. I didn't want out, and I didn't want any confrontations. I asked Johnny to take me home. We let Jimmy out of the car, thinking he would go into the hotel. The last thing I saw was Jimmy sitting cross-legged in the middle of the intersection and cars going around him. I am sure that he got up as soon as we were out of sight. It was an intention getter. The traffic was slow at that time of night, and he knew the cars weren't going to hit him, or at least he hoped they wouldn't. The next day when I saw Jimmy, he didn't apologize for his antics. I was really upset with him and let him know he didn't own me. That did not go over well with Jimmy. It would be several days before we talked again. During this time, one of Jimmy's favorite activities was to grab a beer and go walking down Church Street in the evening. There was an old black man who sat outside the Benny Dillon building and played music every night. 
Jimmy had made friends with him and always stopped to sing as loudly as he could with the old man. Being a generous person, Jimmy never failed to leave a quarter in the old guy's tip hat. In those days, a quarter was like a dollar today. You could buy a hamburger, a Coke, and an ice cream cone with a quarter. Jimmy liked attention and would do anything to get it. One of his stunts was to jump the parking meters on Church Street. Jimmy's legs were short, not long like mine. I often wondered how he could jump the parking meters or kick so high. He and Rudy Lyle used to play, Who Can Kick the Highest? I have some original photos showing them kicking. Anyhow, I was mortified whenever he would jump the meters. I thought people were looking at me and wondering what I was doing with him, a crazy man. Sometimes I wondered the same thing, but he was still my drug of choice. I wanted to leave him, and yet I didn't. I should have noticed that Jimmy was becoming more aggressive and possessive of me. It was more than just wanting to know where I was going, when I was coming back, and who I was going with. I didn't mind that too much because I would ask him the same thing. I told him the truth, but I don't think he told me the truth when he would say where he was going. But I was still a kid, and the only experience I'd had with men was with Mike's father, Carl. I had had a very loving relationship with Carl, and that would probably have lasted a lifetime. But then he had gone to Korea, never to return. So I didn't know what to look for as far as people's habits and personalities. I thought Jimmy was just a temperamental entertainer. At that time, he never hit me and never threatened me despite our sometimes heated words about his drinking. His major problem was infidelity. He just couldn't be true to any one woman. After a few months of partying, Jimmy and I were growing tired of it. We both liked each other a lot and knew that we were going to be together. We decided to talk to my grandparents about moving in with them. I will never forget the day Jimmy and I went to talk to Mama and Daddy Hollis. My grandfather liked to play the fiddle. He wasn't very good at it, but he tried. Jimmy and I went into the house and sat down. Daddy Hollis brought out the fiddle, and Jimmy immediately started talking to him about the fiddle. Daddy Hollis asked Jimmy what his plans were, and Jimmy told him we had gotten married. I think my jaw hit the floor because that wasn't in the plan. Jimmy and I had never talked about marriage. We did talk about the future, mostly his. I liked him a lot, but didn't think I was in love with him. I wanted to be with him, but didn't know if I was ready to be a wife. That was not in my plan at the time. I enjoyed being his girlfriend and hanging out with him. But Mama, she was thrilled thinking we were married. To my knowledge, she never learned the difference.